Good evening. Tonight I'm going to be talking about unwanted pregnancies in literature and there have been many written about from classics to the present day and in the light of recent events in the United States. Rather fascinating to look at various classic works of literature to think about how unwanted pregnancies. This one is of course a book that comes immediately to mind but before talking about that I'm going to go a little bit further back into uh, a time of Thomas Hardy and this book Tess of the D'Urbervilles is a book that I regularly talk about because I love it on many levels but it does have a very tragic unwanted pregnancy. People that don't know the story might think, particularly from this book cover, that Tess is a rather sentimental tale but no, this is actually a book that is very tra deeply tragic, very moving and touches on very many important matters, one of which is rape. Tess is raped at the beginning of the book pretty much because she is sent, and without giving away total spoilers, she's sent by her parents to a relative who, who they think is going to be the, the making of her because they think that Alec d'Urberville is the good fortune that they've been looking for for years. And Tess goes to meet him and he takes advantage of her. She's only a young thing. I think she's only 17 when she first meets Alec d'Urberville. And he completely takes advantage of her and she does indeed fall pregnant. Uh, and being the time of just pre-industrial revolution, there's nothing that Tess can do about her pregnancy other than give in to it, go back to her family and have the baby, which she then does. And she goes through her pregnancy. She's a fallen woman. She knows that her life is effectively ruined and there's no way of turning back time until she then eventually has the baby. And just to make things even more tragic, when the baby's born, she calls him Sorrow. His name is Sorrow, which completely fits with the entirely tragic nature of the scene. And I'm going to read you just a little bit about Sorrow's death. So this is um, not a major spoiler of the book. I'm afraid that tonight there will be quite a few spoilers of books. So if you don't want spoilers, then perhaps this evening isn't for you. But I'm sure that many of you will know the story of Tess anyway. So Sorrow very tragically dies and is then buried. And I'm just going to read you a little bit from that scene because it's, it is a deeply moving and sad scene. And as you can tell, there's a lot more that happens after Sorrow's death in the book. And... I thought it's a particularly interesting book to think about because Tess's life would have been completely different if she could have terminated that pregnancy. It'd be interesting actually to look at all these classics and think about how they would have been rewritten if these women could have actually had an abortion. So I'm going to read you the bit where Tess first christens her baby and then buries him. Sorrow, I baptise thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. She sprinkled the water and then there was silence. Say Amen, children. The tiny voices piped in obedient response. Amen, Tess went on. We receive this child and so forth and do sign him with the sign of the cross. 
Here she dipped her hand into the basin and fervently drew an immense cross across upon the baby with her forefinger, continuing with the customary sentences as to his manfully fighting against sin, the world and the devil, and being a faithful soldier and servant until his life's end. She duly went on with the Lord's Prayer, the children lisping it after her in a thin, gnat-like wail, till, at the conclusion, raising their voices to Clark's pitch, they again piped into the silence, Amen! Then their sister, with much augmented confidence in the efficacy of this sacrament, poured forth from the bottom of her heart the thanksgiving that follows, uttering it boldly and triumphantly in the stopped dispassion note with her voice acquired when her heart was in her speech and which will never be forgotten by those who knew her. The ecstasy of faith almost apotheosed her. It set upon her face a glowing irradiation and brought a red spot into the middle of each cheek while the miniature candle flame inverted in her eye pupils shone like a diamond. That's such a fantastically typical Thomas Hardy moment, finding a tiny detail, the inverted candle flame in her eye socket, shining like a diamond. And she is making this prayer to her dead baby with an incredible fervency and ecstasy of faith. So... In reality, Tess would not have actually wanted to have an abortion. She wouldn't have been able to consider it. So I know that it's an anachronistic concept, but it's still interesting to think what would have happened if Tess had the choice to not have that baby. The children gazed up at her with more and more reverence and no longer had a will for questioning. She did not look like Sissy to them now, but as a being large, towering and awful, a divine personage with whom they had nothing in common. Poor Sorrow's campaign against sin, the world and the devil was doomed to be of limited brilliancy, luckily perhaps for himself, considering his beginnings. In the blue of the morning, that fragile soldier and servant breathed his last, and when the other children awoke, they cried bitterly and begged Sissy to have another pretty baby. So that is a almost funny scene perhaps reading it to our in our eyes because it's so utterly awful and tragic poor Tess having her baby calling it sorrow and then the baby dies almost immediately the minute that it's christened and she has absolutely no choice in any of the events that have happened in her life so far she had to go and meet Alec Derber Derberville he took advantage of her she got pregnant and then she, of course, had to have the baby. And after that, the baby, the fact of her pregnancy will haunt her for the rest of her life and hang over her, making all her later choices horribly in the style of a Greek tragedy because, of course, she meets Angel Claire, who falls in love with her, and she decides to spill the beans about what's happened to her in her past. And Angel, being a devout man, absolutely can't handle it. And he rejects her. Uh, so poor Tess, doomed by falling pregnant after being raped by Alec Derberville. Now, uh, moving on, trying to go in order of the eras which they describe, I'm going to talk about Michelle Faber's fabulous book, The Crimson Petal and the White, which many of you know is one of my favourite books. I do prescribe it a lot to people because it's such a brilliant read. It's completely gripping. It's all about a prostitute called Sugar. And I won't be talking about it in detail tonight at all, but I just really wanted to mention it because... This is a book set in Victorian London and our heroine, Sugar, needs to not get pregnant so that she can, can continue her work as a sex worker. And she's a fantastic character who you completely fall in love with as you read the well nigh thousand pages of this book. And Michelle Faber goes into immense detail 
about the practices of the time of how women stop themselves from falling pregnant. And he describes not only the ways in which they worked in the sex industry using their sheets as a very clever um, method of covering up the mess of copulation. So one of the things I found fascinating when I first read the book was Michelle Faber's great detail about the workings of the sex worker at the time. So for instance, uh, apparently the sex workers would have seven sheets going over their bed with a kind of rubber lining in between them so that every time they saw a man they could get, then whip off the dirty soiled sheet with the rubber that's in between the neck sheet and then move the neck sheet down so that they could see seven men in a day or more depending on how many sheets they had interlayered with the rubber. So that's a fascinating fact. Also, um, there are really fascinating details about the douches that the women used in their nether in order to try and stop themselves from getting pregnant and keeping the effusions of the men from going deep inside their bodies and fertilizing an egg. So this is a book that has a lot of really fascinating detail about avoiding pregnancy in the 18th century in London. So as far as I recall, because it is a little while since I read it, I don't think there are any unwanted pregnancies in the book. There are actually more wanted pregnancies. So that's just one to mention as we go. Then um, thinking of following chronologically in terms of time of books that I'm describing, Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates. So this is an amazing, brilliant and devastating novel, which anyone that hasn't read, I would very much urge you to do so immediately. And I'm afraid there are going to be spoilers here, so avert your eyes and ears if you haven't yet read the book and don't know the story. But it's about a couple, a bright young couple, Frank and April Wheeler, who are bored by the banalities of suburban life and long to be extraordinary. They have two children um, quite rapidly after getting married, falling in love, getting married, and they find that they are indeed being sucked into the banalities of the suburban life. And then when April falls pregnant a third time, she is beginning to realise that her life is never going to live up to the exotic and glamorous visions that she had for herself. And so she takes the terrible action of giving herself a home abortion. Um, and I'm going to read you just a couple of bits from the book, which are a bit harrowing. So be prepared and apologies if you find these scenes disturbing. Um, basically, this scene is when April is about to give herself a home abortion, just to give you full warning. Don't don't listen if you um, don't want to hear it. Actually, it doesn't go into grisly detail. It's just interesting in terms of her preparations. The children's voices faintly followed her as she carried the wastebasket basket back across the lawn. Only by going inside and closing the door was she able to shut them out. She turned off the radio too, and the house became extraordinarily quiet. She put the wastebasket waste basket back in its place and sat down at the desk again with a fresh sheet of paper. This time the letter took no time at all to write. There was only one big important thing to say and it was best said in a very few words, so few as to allow no possible elaborations or distortions of meaning. Dear Frank, whatever happens please don't blame yourself. From old insidious habit she almost added the words I love you, 
but she caught herself in time and made the signature plain. April. She put it in an envelope, wrote Frank on the outside and left it on the exact centre of the desk. In the kitchen, she took down her largest stewing pot, filled it with water and set it on the stove to boil. From storage cartons in the cellar, she got out the other necessary pieces of equipment, the tongs that had once been used for sterilising formula bottles and the blue drugstore box containing the two parts of the syringe, rubber bulb and long plastic nozzle. She dropped these things in the stewing pot, which was just beginning to steam. By the time she'd made the other preparations, putting a supply of fresh towels in the bathroom, writing down the number of the hospital and propping it by the telephone, the water was boiling nicely. It was wobbling the lid of the pot and causing the syringe to nudge and rumble against its sides. It was 9.30. In another 10 minutes she would turn off the heat. Then it would take a while for the water to cool. In the meantime, there was nothing to do but wait. Have you thought it through, April? Never undertake to do a thing until you've... But she needed no more advice and no more instruction. She was calm and quiet now, without knowing what she had always known. Sorry, with knowing what she had always known. What neither her parents, nor Aunt Claire, nor Frank, nor anyone else had ever had to teach her that if you wanted to do something absolutely honest, something true, it always turned out to be a thing that had to be done alone. And now I want to skip ahead to after April's homemade abortion, which she inflicts upon herself because she feels that she has no other choice. This is her third child. People that don't know the book Revolutionary Roads by Richard Yates which is an amazing, brilliant and devastating novel. And I'm afraid this is a major spoiler because it does come near the end of the book. Sorry about that, because I want you to read the book if you haven't read it. But also now you know what happens. So don't listen if you don't want to know. But I'm just going to read you the aftermath of the abortion, the homemade abortion. The Revolutionary Hill Estates had not been designed to accommodate a tragedy. Even at night, as if on purpose, the development held no looming shadows and no gaunt silhouettes. It was invincibly cheerful, a toy land of white and pastel houses, whose bright uncurtained windows winked blandly through a dappling of green and yellow leaves. Proud floodlights were trained on some of the lawns, on some of the neat front doors and on the hips of some of the birthed, ice-cream-coloured, automobiles. A man running down those streets in desperate grief was indecently out of place. Except for the whisk of his shoes on the asphalt and the rush of his own breath, it was so quiet that he could hear the sounds of television in the dozing rooms behind the leaves, a blurred comedian's shout followed by dim spastic waves of laughter and applause, and then the striking up of a band. Even when he veered from the pavement, cut across someone's backyard and plunged into the down-sloping woods, intent on a madman's shortcut to Revolutionary Road. Even then, there was no escape. The house lights beamed and stumbled happily along with him, among the twigs that whipped his face. And once, when he lost his footing and fell scrabbling down a rocky ravine, he came up with a child's enamelled tin beach bucket in his hand. As he clambered out onto asphalt again at the base of the hill, he allowed his dizzy, jogging mind to indulge in a cruel delusion. It had all been a nightmare. He would round this next bend and see the lights blazing in his own house. He would run inside and find her at the ironing board or curled up on the sofa with a magazine. What's the matter, Frank? Your pants are all muddy. Of course I'm all right. But then he saw the house, really saw it, long and milk white in the moonlight with black windows, the only darkened house on the road. She had been very careful about the blood, except for a tidy trail of drops leading out to the telephone and back. It had all been confined to the bathroom, and even there it had mostly been flushed away. Two heavy towels, soaked crimson, lay lumped in the tub close to the drain. I thought that would be the simplest way to handle it, he could hear her saying. I thought you could just wrap the towels up in newspaper and put them in the garbage and then give the tub a good rinsing out, OK? On the floor of the linen closet, he found the syringe in a pot of cold water. 
She'd probably put it there to hide it from the ambulance crew. I mean, I just thought it would be best to get it out of sight. I don't want to have to answer a lot of dumb questions. And his head continued to ring with the sound of her voice as he set to work. There now, that's done, it said when he pressed the newspaper bundles deep into the garbage can outside the kitchen door. And when he returned to fall on his knees and scrub at the trail of drops, it was still with him. Try a damp sponge and a little dry detergent, darling. It's there in the cab. That ought to take it up. There, you see, that's fine. I didn't get any on the rug, did I? Oh, good. It is gripping, isn't it, Lindsay? <laughs> it's actually such, it's so brilliantly written. It's really beautifully written. And one is completely there in every moment of this drama. How could she be dead when the house was alive with the sound of her and the sense of her, even when he'd finished the cleaning, when there was nothing to do but walk around and turn on lights and turn them off again? Even then, her presence was everywhere, as real as the scent of her dresses in the bedroom closet. It was only after he'd spent a long time in the closet, embracing her clothes, that he went back to the living room and found the note she had left him on the desk. And he barely had time to read it and to turn the light off again before he saw the Campbell's Pontiac slowing down for the turn into the driveway. He went quickly back to the bedroom and shut himself inside the closet along the, among the clothes. From there he heard the car rumble to a stop outside. Then the kitchen door opened and there were several faltering footsteps. Frank! Shep called hoarsely. Frank, you here? I'll leave it there. Uh, that is Revolutionary Road, which is one of the most tragic and gripping books that you could read, uh, all about the disintegration, really, of a relationship and the attempt for the couple to be a happy couple as they were trying to fulfil their own American dream, almost consciously, and then when they have a third child, when they know that April is pregnant with the third child, she takes it upon herself to terminate that pregnancy herself. And that scene that I just read you was when things have not gone very well with that termination. So that's one of the most shocking and grim books about unwanted pregnancy but it's also about so much more so much more about marriage about the american dream itself about living in the 50s in america and all the expectations of society and of yourself and i would very much recommend it um and also while i think about it another book that would be great to read if you are interested in that period is the wonderful and brilliant um, book by Bonnie Garmus, which is called Lessons in Chemistry, which is all about being in America in the 60s, end of 50s, early 60s. And it's about a woman who is a chemist and who is very much kicking against the sexist world that she lives in at the time. It's not about unwanted pregnancy. She actually has a child and she's a single mother. But thinking about the era of Revolutionary Road, a more light-hearted read would be Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus, which is an excellent book. Um, another one that also comes to mind, thinking of trying to go chronologically in order about the books we're talking about this evening, is uh, The Colour Purple by Alice Walker, which is a book which does have two unwanted pregnancies at the least. And it's about a girl who is in an abusive relationship from a very early age in her teens. She's only 13, I think, when she's first raped and gets pregnant. And that happens to her twice. And both of her babies are then taken away from her and given to unknown adoptive parents, unknown to her. And the book is all written in her own words to God. So 
each of the chapters starts, Dear God, and Seely, the heroine, then tells her story to God, who is, um, sorry, she is finding the only person that she can talk to, and that is God. And that's an absolutely brilliant, gripping and fabulous read, which I would very highly recommend to anyone that hasn't read it. That's The Colour Purple by Alice Walker. And in that book, there are two unwanted pregnancies. And we do have the, res the resonances of those pregnancies throughout the book, which very interestingly come back at the end of the book back into Seely's life but I won't give away full spoilers with that and that's a book that I do talk about regularly because it's a really good read and it's also a book that although it has a lot of tragedy and sadness in it it also has um, a lot of positivity and rising above the odds so it's actually a great bibliotherapy book because it's one which gets you very much um, into the mind frame of overcoming the odds, which is what Seely herself does. So that is a great read. Um, we must, of course, talk about The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. I'm sure that Margaret Atwood would have many interesting comments about what's been happening in the States recently with the abortion laws. And I do feel that she might think that her words are rather frighteningly seeming to be very prophetic and for people that don't know the story of The Handmaid's Tale I'm sure that lots of you will have seen the Netflix version which I think might be five series and they are actually brilliant they're really good reworking of this original idea and The Handmaid's Tale is about a woman called Offred who lives in the Republic of Gilead and Offred's only function in this Republic is to breed because in this dystopian reality most people have become infertile and anyone that is fertile has to give up their rights as a woman and join the people that have power and money in order to give them babies in a nutshell and so the handmaids are the women who are able to conceive and they have to effectively join a rich couple or a couple who are very high up in society and get in between them when they're having sex in order to be impregnated and then to give their baby to the couple. So this is a quite extreme version of unwanted pregnancy because it is consensual, but it's also the only choice that these women have because if they don't join in with this ritual, then they will be sent into the world outside where they will inevitably die a painful and grim death due to the radiation that's going on in the outside world or if they don't comply with what's being asked of them they will be hung and the world that they live in is a very totalitarian religious state. I'm going to read you a section from the ceremony which is the ceremony of when the handmaid joins with the couple. Um, it is quite graphic just to warn you, so if you're not ready for graphic language, this would be a moment to mute or go and make a cup of tea and then come back. Or maybe a gin tea could be that time. The ceremony goes as usual. I lie on my back, fully clothed except for the healthy white cotton underdrawers. What I could see if I were to open my eyes would be the large white canopy, canopy of Serena Joy's outsized colonial style four poster bed, suspended like a sagging cloud above us, a cloud sprigged with tiny drops of silver rain, which, if you looked at them closely, would turn out to be four petaled flowers. I would not see the carpet which is white, or the sprigged curtains and skirted dressing table with its silver backed brush and mirror set, only the canopy 
which manages to suggest at one and the same time by the gauziness of its fabric and its heavy downward curve, both ethereality and matter. Or the sail of the ship. Big bellied sails, they used to say, in poems. Bellying, propelled forward by a swollen belly. You're getting the uh, pregnancy imagery here, I'm sure, with all those lovely metaphors. Um, this is becoming X-rated anyway, so be prepared for a bit of X-rated language from Margaret Atwood. A mist of lily of the valley surrounds us, chilly crisp almost. It's not warm in this room. Above me, towards the head of the bed, Serena Joy is arranged outspread. Her legs are apart. I lie between them, my head on her stomach, her pubic bone under the base of my skull, her thighs on either side of me. She too is fully clothed. My arms are raised. She holds my hands, each of mine and each of hers. This is supposed to signify that we are one flesh, one being. What it really means is that she's in control of the process and thus of the product. If any, the rings of her left hand cut into my fingers. It may or may not be revenge. My red skirt, handmaids have to wear red to signify that they are the ones that menstruate and are fertile. Though no higher, below it the commander is fucking. What he is fucking is the lower part of my body. I do not say making love because this is not what he's doing. Because it would imply two people and only one is involved. Nor does rape cover it. Nothing is going on here that I haven't signed up for. There wasn't a lot of choice, but there was some, and this is what I chose. Therefore, I lie still and picture the unseen canopy over my head. I remember Queen Victoria's advice to her daughter. Close your eyes and think of England. But this is not England. I wish you would hurry up. Maybe I'm crazy and this is some new kind of therapy. I wish it were true, then I could get better and this would go away. Serena Joy grips my hands as if it is she, not I, who's being fucked, as if she finds it e either pre pleasurable or painful, and the commander fucks with a regular 2-4 marching stroke, on and on, like a tap dripping. He is preoccupied like a man humming to himself in the shower, without knowing he's humming, like a man who has other things on his mind. It's as if he's somewhere else, waiting for himself to come, drumming his fingers on the table while he waits. There's an impatience in his rhythm now. But isn't this everyone's wet dream, two women at once? They used to say that. Exciting, they used to say. What's going on in this room under Serena Joy's silvery canopy is not exciting. It has nothing to do with passion or love or romance or any of those other notions we used to titillate ourselves with. It has nothing to do with sexual desire, at least for me, and certainly not for Serena. Arousal and orgasm are no longer thought necessary. They would be a symptom of frivolity merely, like jazz garters or beauty spots, superfluous distractions for the light-minded, outdated. It seems odd that women once spent such time and energy reading about such things, thinking about them, worrying about them, writing about them. They are so obviously recreational. This is not recreation even for the commander. This is serious business. The commander too is doing his duty. If I were to open my eyes a slit, I would be able to see him, his not unpleasant face hanging over my torso, with a few strands of his silver hair falling perhaps over his forehead, intent on his inner journey, that place he is hurrying towards, which recedes as in a dream at the same speed with which he approaches. I would see his open eyes. If he were better looking, would I enjoy this more? At least he's an improvement on the previous one, who smelled like a church cloakroom in the rain, like your mouth when the dentist starts picking at your teeth, like a nostril. The commander instead smells of mothballs. Or is this odour some punitive form of aftershave? Why does he have to wear that stupid uniform? But why is tufted raw body any better? Kissing is forbidden between us. This makes it bearable. One detaches oneself. One describes. He comes at last with a stifled groan as, as of relief. Serena Joy, who's been holding her breath, expels it. The commander, who's been propping himself on his elbows, away from our combined bodies, 
doesn't permit himself to sink down unto us. He rests a moment, withdraws, recedes, rezippers. He nods, then turns and leaves the room, closing the rated care between, behind him, as if both of us are his ailing mother. There's something hilarious about this, but I don't dare laugh. Serena Joy lets go of my hands. You can get up now, she says. Get up and get out. She's supposed to have me rest for 10 minutes with my feet on a pillow to improve the chances. This is meant to be a time of silent, silent meditation for her, but she's not in the mood for that. There is loathing in her voice, as if the touch of my flesh sickens and contaminates her. I untangle myself from her body. The juice of the commander runs down my legs. Before I turn away, I see her straighten her blue skirt, clench her legs together. She continues lying on the bed, gazing up at the canopy above her, stiff and straight as an effigy. Which of us is it worse for, her or me? But that's The Handmaid's Tale, which is probably the ultimate book about unwanted pregnancy. And for people that don't know it, it is an incredibly moving book. It actually starts with the heroine who becomes Offred. Um, she actually has a different name at the beginning because I, one of the things I love about the book is the way that every woman in the state takes on their husband's name. So they might be Offred, Offred or off Pete, or off Patrick, off Patrick, quite hilarious anyway. Um, and it starts at the beginning with her running away, attempting to run away with her daughter, because she has a daughter, and trying to start a new life with her daughter and husband. And that does not succeed. And that's how the state knows that she can have children, because she does indeed have a child. And it's utterly harrowing. It is a brilliant uh, adapted version on Netflix as well. And I do thoroughly recommend it. Uh, but it is deeply disturbing as well. So moving on to other books of unwanted pregnancy. Room by Emma Donoghue. Now this, sorry everyone this evening, all of these books are disturbing because they all contain harrowing scenes or harrowing scenes off stage of, of rape and of reasons for unwanted pregnancy. And this book, uh, Room by Emma Donoghue, is based on a true story of a woman who was kept in a shed uh, against her will in Austria, which I think many of you will know the story um, from real life. And Emma Donoghue wrote a fictionalised version of it, which is an absolutely fantastic read, written in the voice of her son. And I will read you a little bit of it. But I, I think one of the brilliant things about this book is you actually never have any traumatic scenes of rape, but you do know that it's happening because the man keeps uh, the heroine against her will in this shed. And every night he comes in and has sex with her. And we know from the start of the book that she has a son who is his son. And the boy hides in the cupboard every night while this is happening. He doesn't know what's going on. He's, um, even though he knows it's not good, he actually doesn't get deeply disturbed by what's happening because he doesn't understand it and he doesn't have really any sense of what's happening because he's hiding in the cupboard but of course we know as readers what's happening and it's deeply disturbing and unpleasant but although it is a very depressing concept the book itself is bizarrely uplifting because it is the story of a woman's triumph against adversity and her son, the five-year-old who's the voice of the book, is in fact the instrument of her escaping from the room. Sorry, everyone. Spoilers again. I'm afraid this is a night of spoilers. I'm going to read you a little bit so that you will get a sense of what the book is like as a read. Um, so it's very interestingly written in the voice of the five-year-old boy. 
and some people have criticized this because they've said that he's too clever he's too um precocious to be the narrator of the tale he doesn't sound like he's five but i completely believed in him and in the voice of the book and really loved his voice and he just tells the story brilliantly so i'll read you a bit and you can decide for yourselves what you think it's the very beginning Today I'm five. I was four last night, going to sleep in wardrobe, but when I wake up in bed in the dark, I'm changed to five. Abracadabra. Before that, I was three, then two, then one, then zero. Was I minus numbers? Hmm? Ma does a big stretch. Up in heaven. Was I minus one, minus two, minus three? Nah, the numbers didn't start till you zoomed down. Through skylight. You were all sad till I happened in your tummy. You said it. Ma leans out of bed to switch on lamp. He makes everything light up. Whoosh. I shut my eyes just in time, then open one a crack, then both. I cried till I didn't have any tears left, she tells me. I just lay there counting the seconds. How many seconds, I ask her. Millions and millions of them. No, but how many exactly? I lost count, says Ma. Then you wished and wished on your egg till you got fat, she grins. I could feel you kicking. What was I kicking? Me, of course. I always laugh at that bit. So that's Room by Emma Donoghue. And as you can tell from the beginning of that book, uh, the boy doesn't know anything about his deeply disturbing origins and his mum keeps him completely in the dark about what's really happening the fact that she's imprisoned in a shed and that they live in this one room and the book is called room because the boy believes that room is his is the only reality it's all there is in the world and although they do have a tv and they watch it every night he believes that the tv is a completely different reality so everything that seems to happen on the TV is just a nothing to do with their reality. He just has bed, wardrobe, um, table, skylight, and so on. And he and his mother, Ma, go through rituals every day in which they, for instance, they do their exercises and <clears throat> they eat the food that they're given by the man. They collect eggshells from the food they're given and make things out of the eggshells. And in the novel Cure, Susan and I talked about this book, Room, being a brilliant cure for boredom because Ma and the boy have to exist in this world of absolute tedium where literally nothing ever changes. But they manage to very interesting and rich day despite what you might imagine a lot of the time uh obviously they are trapped and ma is in a deeply disturbed state because she's trapped and she's being visited by the man every night but she does an absolutely amazing job of keeping her son entertained and interested and they do all these exercises every day and one of their exercises is scream when they scream at the skylight every night in order to try and be rescued and so although this is the story of the fruit of an unwanted pregnancy is actually a book which has a lot of positive energy in it because the boy is the hero of the novel and he is the instrument of Mars escape from the room to give away spoilers and it's actually a really gripping and exhilarating read though admittedly the second half of the book becomes rather sad in a different way to when Ma is actually trapped in the room with her son who's only five so another brilliant read if a very disturbing one we've had lots of rather sad brilliant 
and tragic books this evening. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple more before we stop. Of course, uh, young adult authors love to write about unwanted pregnancies, and there's a few fantastic novels from the young adult world, which I absolutely love. And this is one of my favourites, Boys Don't Cry by Mallory Blackman, which is all about a, a young man um, called Dante who thinks that he's just about to embark on a glittering academic career. He's about to get his A-level results one morning and he's an incredibly hard worker and he's due to get really high scores when suddenly this girl turns up on his doorstep and she's his ex-girlfriend and she has a baby with her and he had absolutely no idea but this baby is his so this is actually not a book about an unwanted pregnancy it, or it happens in the past so we know that there was an unwanted pregnancy and the girl the, he the heroine who we actually barely see in the book she leaves the baby with our hero Dante and he becomes a single dad, age only 17. And um, he does, of course, get brilliant A-level results. I think he gets three A's. He was headed for Oxford, but instead he's got a baby. And this is all about Dante's journey becoming a father. And it's actually such a lovely read. I completely adored it. It's a book I'd recommend to people of all ages, not just a young adult book. Uh, Mallory Blackman, superb writer. Our whole family has read it and we've all absolutely loved it. Sobbed and laughed. And it's a very ultimately upbeat read. Uh, and it does start with an unwanted pregnancy. Another one of the same ilk is Trouble by Non Pratt. A girl, a boy, a girl, a bump. I'll just read you what it says on the back. Hannah is smart and funny. She's also 15 and pregnant. Aaron is the new boy at school. He doesn't want to attract attention. So why does Aaron offer to be the pretend dad to Hannah's unborn baby? Look at that great cover. Love those graphics. This is a really great read as well, uh, which I think is another excellent description of what it's like having an unwanted pregnancy in your teens. And I would recommend this again to all readers, but particularly it is a great one for teenagers. Um, there's many in this kind of world. There's another great book called Megan, which is all about... Megan, the girl who gets pregnant. Uh, I think it might be by Meg Cabot, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Sorry if I've got that wrong. And another one, which I would utterly recommend, is called Only Ever Yours by Louise O'Neill, which unfortunately I don't have a copy to you because I lent it out. And that, Only Ever Yours, is somewhat of a modern version of The Handmaid's Tale. It was written, I think, about 10 years ago, whereas this was written back in the 80s. And Only Ever Yours is all about a dystopian society where everyone is segregated, all the women are segregated, into three options of what they're going to do with their lives. They're the Eves. I can't remember all the names of the different factions, but the Eves are the ones who are selected to have babies. And then there's another group who are going to just be workers and another group who are going to be teachers. Oh, and there's also, of course, a group who are going to be prostitutes or sex slaves. And it's a really interesting book. It's another one in which... Uh, Almost nobody is fertile left in the world. And so that, that's why they've had to regulate people and um, bring them up in these strange new ways so that all of the girls born on a certain day, they're all in one pod, 
and they're all given these different roles in society and the eves are the ones that are destined to have babies and it's just as sin sinister and depressing and brilliant as the handmaid's tale uh and it's another fascinating read and then i did have just one more book that i was about to mention and now it's completely gone from my mind oh i know what it was it was um the Millstone by Margaret Drabble, which is a book about a woman who gets pregnant and she's called Rosamond. She's an attractive Cambridge graduate who seems destined for a glittering career. And she is a virgin, but she likes to pretend to her friends that she's having sex with two different men for some reason, really because she's actually a bit scared of having sex and it's quite convenient for her to give that impression so that she can just do her own thing and no one will bother her and everyone thinks that she's having a bit of a racy old time. And then she does meet a man who she falls in love with. Um, they sleep together possibly only once. He disappears, leaving her heartbroken because she's too shy to tell him that she actually did love him and she's left pregnant. And Rosamond is a really cool customer who just goes along with whatever fate is throwing in her direction. And she has the baby without too much concern. And But because it's set in the 60s, Everyone very much frowns upon her decision. Her parents have left the country for a year and they're deeply uninvolved with the whole thing. But everyone is really shocked and horrified. So everyone else thinks that it's an unwanted pregnancy, even though she doesn't. Uh, this is The Millstone by Margaret Drabble, which is a fantastic book. And it's very interesting in terms of thinking about being pregnant in the 1960s when everyone was disapproving of you being a single mother. And the millstone refers to the idea that a baby would be a millstone around your neck. Actually, Rosamond completely falls in love with her baby, Octavia. And then her baby has a heart condition and she's incredibly scared that everything is going to go horribly wrong. And she's really terrified for her baby's child's life. And I won't tell you what happens, but it's a great novel. And that's about the idea of other people perceiving your pregnancy to be negative when in fact it's not for you. So that's a few brilliant and amazing classic novels about unwanted pregnancies. I would very much recommend all of these as brilliant reads. I'm sorry that tonight's session has been generally uh, about quite intense and often more depressing types of books but there's a couple of them which are more upbeat particularly Mallory Blackman's Boys Don't Cry and Trouble by Non Pratt. Non Pratt, great writer. Um, and I wonder if you listeners and watchers out there have any comments or thoughts about other unwanted pregnancies in literature. If you do have any that you'd care to share with me, I would love to hear from you. So do send me a message on Instagram or on Facebook, uh, or you can send me a message on Twitter, or indeed email me, ella at ellabear2.com. Um, thanks. And anyone that ever wants a bibliotherapy session, one-to-one, -one, just get in touch with me here by email and I'd love to have a bibliotherapy session with you. That's when we talk all about books for an hour and we talk about what's happening in your life and then give you a prescription for the perfect books to read. So do get in touch if you would ever like a bibliotherapy session. Um, hopefully I'll be back next week. It's all getting a bit hectic because it's the summer holidays coming up. Uh, but I'll keep you posted and very likely see you next Wednesday. And I'll be doing another Damien Barr Literary Salon session 
um, in a month's time, July the 27th. So see you soon. Have a great evening and thanks for coming. Good night.